Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans, hey, and college basketball fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Show. As you noticed, uh, you're already looking into the cockpit here. We have uuh, uh, we have uh, basically camera set up all through the cockpit so you can see who's flying the plane along with where we're going. And you can see my co-pilot once again is Andy Backstrom, young man from LettermanRow.com and On3.com, where I also happen to work. Uh, but uh, Andy, welcome once again to the Tim May Show. It's always good to be here, Tim. We're talking spring football and basketball. March Madness finally yeah. coming up. March Madness, March Madness, man. And uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Ohio State fans, do they have a reason to be getting madder? You know, we're going to talk about that and more. Uh, but first, I wanted to hit you. You know, you also cover you cover Ohio State basketball for us at LettermanRoad.com. But you also, you, me, and uh, and uh, Spencer Holbrook, that was not good grammar there I used. But, but uh, you, Spencer Holbrook, and I cover Ohio State football. And I just wanted to get your take before we move on. We got to see two practices without full pads, but we at least got to watch two of the what are, what are going to be 15 practices of spring of Ohio State last week before they went into this spring break this week. It's funny. They want to get these guys thinking football before they head off to the beaches, et cetera. But uh, before you head off to covering football full time for um, basketball full time for a little while, what just stuck in your head after those first two practices? Give me one thing that stuck in your head. I think just this quarterback competition I keep thinking about because we all went into this spring saying, Will Howard's the guy, Will Howard's the guy. And he is the front runner. You don't bring in someone for no reason. So that is clear. But Devin Brown looked really sharp these first couple of practices. And maybe he should because he's been in the system longer than anyone else that's in that quarterback room right now. But it's not just Devin Brown, and Will Howard. Those are two main suitors for this job. But I felt like all those quarterbacks had impressive throws. Aaron Nolan and Julian Sayan, they're fun to watch too. They've got a long way to go. But then you have Lincoln Keenholz that looks like almost a different person. I mean, he's yeah. just at seven or eight pounds of muscle and finally looks like he fits in now that he's actually there for a spring. So a lot of excitement with this quarterback room. You probably won't have five going into the season, but boy, it's it's a lot of fun to watch five of them right now compete. Yeah, you know, and, it, and everybody keeps saying that there probably won't be five. There, there might not be. But all you know is what you know right now, and there are five. And, you know, it's going to be interesting the more this goes on to see how a uh, new offensive coordinator, quarterbacks coach Chip Kelly divvies up the reps. As Ryan Day said, and and even uh, Chip Kelly said, the main idea uh, the first couple of days and maybe even, you know, next week when they, when they jumpstart this thing, the spring football, um, is get all these guys playing football again and then maybe start divvying up the reps a little bit different because that's the only way you really get to who the, the, the better player is. And, you know, there's no, there's no reason why a Julian Sayan or an Aaron Nolan couldn't make a move in spring and maybe jump into this at least consideration because they're both highly rated players. Julian Sayan, the number one prospect in the 2024 recruiting class overall at quarterback there's no reason why he couldn't get into this, right? I mean, uh, if he comes out firing when they really start playing real football, the guy is super talented. We all know that. And I'm just throwing that hypothetical out there. But I think you agree with me, right? You don't you don't write anybody off at this moment. No, you don't write anyone off. And I wouldn't write off Lincoln Keenholz either. I mean, no. playing the game was thrust into a situation where, you know, it was not ideal whatsoever. Not only had he not had – experience in a meaningful game situation but he also didn't have an offensive line that was giving him a lot of support but he just looks like a different guy just the yeah. zip on the ball that he has has always been impressive but now he has that base to throw from that's, that's really interesting and, and supportive for him and so you have those three kind of stick out to me will howard lincoln keenholds and devin brown feel like they're in a category of their own mainly just because aaron nolan and julian sane haven't had the experience there are two spring practices in their early enrollees they're guys that as the coaches love to say, it could be at prom or getting ready for prom right now. So I do think that those other three are in a category of their own at this moment, and they should be. They've been around more, and especially Will Howard and Devin Brown. And Will Howard, I think, will just take a little bit of time to get going. Anytime you're in a new system, in a new building with new receivers, it's going to take a minute. And so that hasn't been totally surprising to see him number two behind Devin Brown in those drills, just as Seth McLaughlin is number two in the center drills behind Carson Hinsman. They're not just going to be handed a job here at Ohio State. It takes a bit of time to, A, earn it, and B, just get used to this system. 
Yeah. And the other thing is uh, you have to keep in mind when you're watching the little bit we got to watch of the quarterbacks actually throwing the ball to receivers kind of reminds me of the combine, you know, uh, for Will Howard, as opposed to a real practice for, uh, for Devin Brown, because Devin Brown has thrown to most of those guys a lot already, you know, and yeah. uh, Will Howard is more like he's shown up at the, at the combine and now, you know, throw to these receivers. You have no idea how fast they are, uh, where they're going, et cetera, in a lot of cases before you play with them for a little while. So, yeah, the next uh, 13 practices are going, including the spring game. Very much looking forward to this spring game. Uh, not that they're going to run anything we're going to see in the fall too much uh, from a from a top secret standpoint, but you're going to see the quarterbacks, you know, throwing the ball. You're going to see the quarterbacks running the zone read option for real, except they're not going to be tackled on the end of it. Uh, all these little things that uh, that you maybe didn't get to see last year, especially when Devin Brown hurt his finger uh, before the spring game and didn't get to play. I think the spring game could be very interesting, knock on wood, if these guys stay healthy. I uh, also wanted to ask you uh, one of the quickie before we move on from there. Uh, from what you've watched of the offensive line, I'm trying not to say uh very much. I used to have a cut uh, up, uh, which I would put a uh, dollar in every time I said uh. And I need to re reinstate that, but I don't want to go broke. I'm semi-retired. But the bottom line is, uh, if you look at the offensive line, do you see the ingredients there? Do you feel better is not the right term because you're not an, necessarily a high State fan and or coach, but uh, do you feel buoyed by what you saw the first two days from what you saw on the offensive line, which is trying to replace one starter, but kind of playing musical chairs there with the guys coming back and including uh, Seth McLaughlin, uh, the kid who transferred in from Alabama, the starting center for Alabama the last two seasons. He's trying to figure out whether he might fit better at center or guard. But what just what was your quick take on the Ohio State offensive line? Definitely a little bit more confident. I mean, the, the bar is pretty low. The last time we saw them actually play a game, it was abysmal in the college. Yeah. But I do really like Luke Montgomery at right guard. I think that's a really good fit for him. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's a day one starter there. I, mean, I think that is telling that he's already there right now. I think he fits really well in a Chip Skelly, uh, Chip Kelly scheme, just the way he can bend and move and how agile he is. And he's around 6'4", 6'5". He's up to like 308 pounds. So he's put on some muscle with this Mick Marathi strength program the last year. And I think he's super talented. He was one of those crown jewels of the last year's recruiting class. And I think he's one of Justin Fry's guys, right? Now he's finally being able to incorporate his guys into this offensive line. Luke Montgomery has been great uh, so far. I mean, again, we see very little right now. There's not blocking happening the first couple of practices, but just seeing him out there and the way he moves, he just seems like he could be a really effective pulling guard in Chip so, Kelly's game. Yeah. But so, so you would expect more, to see Luke Montgomery perhaps at right guard and Josh Fryer at right tackle where he played last year, right? I mean, the, the big talk going into camp, of course, or spring football was that they would slide Josh Fryer down to right guard and maybe Luke Montgomery and uh, Tegra Shabola would have a shootout uh, for that right tackle spot. But uh, you see it, you, you're you starting to see it. You're starting to buy into the Montgomery right guard, uh, uh, Josh Fryer right tackle, right? Yeah, yeah, and I think, like, Donovan Jackson someone that you could play at tackle this whole time he's been at Ohio State, but they like him at guard. I think that's the same thing with Luke Montgomery. It's not that he can't play tackle. It's yeah. just I think he's a better fit at guard right now in his career and this scheme that Chip Kelly has that's going to build into this Ryan Day offense. And I think that that's a really good fit for him. And then right tackle, I think, is kind of a competition. Like, Josh Fryer has a leg up because he started a full season there, but I wouldn't rule out Tugger at Chabola there at that position and George Fitzpatrick and, you know, a, a couple of these other guys that we've mentioned for a couple of years now, Zim Mahalski, I guess would be somewhere in the realm of that misc. Um, but really I think it's, it's Josh Fryer and Tegra Shabola that will be competing at that position for right tackle. And I don't think it's being handed to Josh Fryer at all. I think he's got to prove it. And then center, I asked Ryan day about that, you know, where is Carson Hinsman at? Because last time we heard from Ryan day about Carson Hinsman, it, it didn't sound too great. He was struggling yeah. a lot towards the end of the season, so much so that he was benched for that Cotton Bowl game. We don't know all of the details of that, but didn't play in that game and things didn't look good. But there he was out there with the first team, or at least what looked like the first team offensive line at the beginning of spring. And he said that he had a major offseason, a lot of improvement in the weight room, numbers are up, um, and they like the progress he's made. So that's going to be a real competition too with Seth McLaughlin because he didn't have a great end to his season either, Tim. Yeah. I mean, there was, a, there was a lot that went wrong with snapping the football down there in Alabama and especially in that Rose Bowl game. Yeah. 
Yeah, that that to me. See, just when you just when you want to write things in in ink, you know, off the transfer portal, you better put them in pencil, because like the center spot is up for grabs. It looks like, and the quarterback spot, as we speak right now, looks like it's up for grabs. And they both have high profile transfers in. Uh, you know, and uh, a guy in Will Howard who won a big help win a Big 12 championship in an overtime game against uh, TCU two years ago. TCU got, went on and played in the college football playoff and upset Michigan. And then you got Seth uh, uh, Seth McLaughlin, the center from Alabama, who yeah he had some a few bad snaps in the uh, Rose Bowl, the college football playoff semifinal against Michigan. But the guy was a starter at Alabama for what the last two years for the most part. Uh, yet you got guys you've recruited, you know, who you thought were going to be future Buckeye standouts and Carson Hensman and Devin Brown hanging in there, right, and uh, battling for that job. So those are two jobs you're really going to keep your eye on because what starts off, what what jump starts an offense? It's that quarterback, uh, that center to quarterback exchange, and uh, can't get any bigger than that. Hey, speaking of that, uh, let's just jump immediately into the basketball here instead of having some kind of clever segue. You've been keeping up with this. You were around, obviously, uh, last year, the last part of the Chris Holtman era. And the Well, the last part of the Chris Holtman era was actually this year at the beginning of the season, but then the big change came in February. And I just wanted to ask you, if you, if you, could, if you could put your finger on one thing that's different about this basketball program now compared to five weeks ago, one thing, what is it? I think it's just aggressiveness. They play with aggressiveness on offense, but they also play with aggressiveness on defense. And that kind of feeds the offense. You see them running in transition and they're running in transition because they're creating turnovers on defense and everything is just kind of connecting together right now. They're just playing as one and they're playing with fire. And I, I just felt like they didn't have that with Chris Holtman. And I just felt like they were maybe playing a little too tight at times. They weren't running up and down the floor. It was a lot of half court sets on offense and things just got clunky and there were late shot clock possessions, and it felt like if it wasn't Bruce Thornton and if it wasn't Jamison Battle and if it wasn't Roddy Gale Jr., they weren't scoring. And now it just feels like everyone can score. Dale Bonner suddenly is scoring. <laughs> Devin Royal is playing really well. Scotty Middleton is playing really well. You know, even Taysen Chapman banks in a three-pointer in the last game against Rutgers, and it just feels like everyone's contributing now. It's not predictable anymore, and they're playing with an aggressiveness that gives them a chance against any team. When he banked it in, did he call it? Did you hear? It? Did he call it? Couldn't hear it. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah. you know, I think it just speaks to the depth that they had. I think this was always an NCAA tournament team, and I think Chris Holman is a, a fantastic recruiter, and that's why they have this roster. But in terms of getting the most out of each piece and maximizing the talent, he just wasn't able to do it his last few years. And Jake Diebler's found a way to really hold the guys accountable and maximize each of their talents and play all of them at once during a time in the season where you see a lot of coaches trim the rotation to seven, even six guys at, at points, but usually seven to eight guys. And Jake Deaver is playing 10 plus every game. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. By the way, they play on Thursday uh, in Minneapolis in the college, in the uh, big 10 tournament, the second day of the big 10 tournament, they're playing Nebraska. Uh, no, excuse me. They're playing Iowa. How far can this basketball team, Ohio state basketball team go in the Big Ten tournament. And then I'm going to ask you the uh, 64, excuse me, $68,000 question in a moment. Yeah. But uh, how far can this team go, in your opinion? I think uh, the way things, the way the dominoes fell uh, last last weekend, this past weekend, they got a little bit of a break, right? I mean, from a serendipity standpoint, they're playing their, the what, uh, uh, 10 seed? Do I have that right? Yep. Yeah. Seed. So they're playing, uh, they're playing Iowa first, and then they'll play the winner. Or they'll play in the second round, not against number one seed, but the number two seed, right? So, yeah. uh, so how far can this team go? Yeah, well, they need to win at least two games. I think they have a shot to to really make the final if they win those two games. So you play Iowa the first game, and I don't think that's a bad matchup at all. I actually think that's favorable. If they were the nine seed, they would have had to play Michigan State which is always a tough team to play this time of year. The way Tom Izzo has his team playing in March is always tough. So Iowa you face, which I think they can win that game. They actually almost beat Iowa in Iowa City in February. They just didn't get a shot up. There was a situation before that. 
that was kind of the end of the Chris Holtman era. But one yeah. of the last few games were just you, you scratch your head and say, why did that happen? Well, okay, now they're a different team and they're in a different place and they're playing Iowa on a neutral site. I think if they can win that game, then you play Illinois, the number two seed, and you'd much rather play Illinois than number one, Purdue. So if you were the nine seed, you would have to beat Michigan State first. And even if you won that, you'd have to play Purdue. To beat Purdue once in a season is possible. To beat them twice in a season, that's really tough to do, especially against Zach Eady and the way they rely on him. Um, you can make the argument that Purdue is a little bit one-dimensional with Edy and that the guard play is inconsistent, but I do think that you have to like the favorable matchup playing the number two seed in Illinois better. So if they can get by Illinois, then you're facing Nebraska or Indiana most likely, and I think those are two both beatable teams in that situation. That would be in a semifinal game for a chance to play in the final. So you win two games, you give yourself a really realistic shot to hear your name on sec uh, Selection Sunday. You win three games, I think you're a lock for a spot in, in the field of 68. But really, you need at least two in the Big Ten tournament to have a chance. Yeah. See, I was telling some people around the basketball program after uh, that rousing win over Rutgers. And it was. I mean, they were up by two at halftime and ended up winning by, what, 20 or whatever it was. But the bottom line was – what what I really like about this team is what you touched on about the previous meeting with Iowa. This team no under Diebler is finishing games, man. They're even at Minnesota, they finished that game. I mean, they came back, you know, and, and made a run at it. The, the bottom line is, I don't think you count a, a talented team like this Ohio State team is. Is the most talented team in the country? No. Is it most talented in the Big Ten? No. But it's one of the more talented teams in the country. And uh, they put their act together. When you put your act together along with your uh, your resolve, you you can go a long way. So, I mean, I was I was thinking if they get the twenty wins somehow. This was like two weeks ago. If they got the twenty wins, which would take a win in the Big Ten tournament, the opening round, their opening round of the Big Ten tournament, I think they got a great shot at getting into the big into the NCAA tournament. Obviously. Maybe some other things have to happen. You never know what's going to happen, right? But I heard some people still talking about Michigan State being a viable, uh, being a viable candidate for making the NCAA tournament. Well, they're going into this tournament one loss or uh, one win behind Ohio State, and Ohio State has a win in hand over Michigan State. So uh, I think a lot of that's based on tradition and the way things have always gone, as opposed to looking at this Ohio State team and the way it's playing right now. So my my. I'm I'm really curious if they win and win convincingly against Iowa and then go against the number two seed Illinois and are competitive against Illinois. I think they've got a hell of an argument for being one of those uh, quote last teams into the NCAA tournament. Here's my question: Can Jake Diebler can Jake Diebler maintain this job? Keep this job? He he will keep this job if what happens in the Big Ten tournament. There you go. That's putting the onus on you. Yeah, I, I think they've got to make the NCAA tournament for him to have a, a chance of being hired full time. And so that for me means at least two wins in the Big Ten tournament. And the reason why Michigan State has the leg up, I think it's a fair question. Why, you know, they're 18 wins. They, they've lost a few games recently that they shouldn't have lost, including one to Ohio State at home. But their net ranking is really high. And that's what the NCAA committee really values and the reason why their net ranking is higher is because they have more quad one wins which means against teams that are within a certain bracket at the top of the country it's it's all analytical right and yeah. i know a lot of people don't like that system but they do have wins they, they beat mary uh they beat baylor early in the season they beat in illinois they've got some quality resume wins that kind of stack up and it doesn't matter when those wins come just like ohio state has a win against alabama in november and that really helps them right now so I know there are things you can point at and be like, well, that shouldn't count as much, but then there are some of those things that are actually helping Ohio state right now. So yeah, it, I agree. It's one of those situations. But I think Jake Diebler to your point, like he needs to get them to the NCAA tournament. I think for this to be a really difficult decision for Ross Bjork because, you know, he wants to make a statement with this first hire. And I think that, you know, you do everything you can to keep Jake Diebler on staff at this point, no doubt, you know, even with the five of six games winning to make this even a conversation, I think you have to put in the resources to retain him on staff, elevate pay, do whatever you need to get him to stay because that keeps the core here. As far as head coach goes, you know, I think I think he still needs to do a little bit more and that might not be fair, but I just think given the situation, the standard at Ohio State, 
and kind of the statement higher that Ross Bjork might want to make, you might be dealing with that kind of situation. Yeah, the interesting thing about what you just said, though, is if you if you keep a Jake Diebler on staff after he's done what he's done, the inspiration he's shown here in the last uh, month, it, which is off the chart, in my opinion, a team given up for dead. Uh, I mean, not even making the NIT tournament, much less possibly making the NCAA tournament now. Uh, well, I said that about the NIT. I'm not even sure what you got to do to get in the NIT anymore. It seems very convoluted. But the bottom line is, I think you risk a uh, – I think I think you would risk a, an allegiance uh, problem uh, with your players, you know, who have now who have clearly turned on the Jets and are playing hard for Jake Diebler. And I think if you had him still on staff along with uh, whoever they end up hiring, you know, we've seen the leading candidates. I, you know, I personally like the the Dusty May guy just because of his last name at Florida Atlantic. <laughs> but uh, but I'm just throwing that out there, you yeah. know for fun. Um, you know, I just, I think it'd be, a, I think it'd be tough to retain Jake Diebler based on the way this team has responded to him. And now all of a sudden he would be an assistant coach again. You know, what do you do with that? Because clearly once he got the megaphone, uh, he had something to say and it has yeah. paid off big time for this team. So, you know, I'm kind of rooting for him now because for a couple of reasons, number one, I think he's been biding his time and for the right moment. And he has struck, he has struck like a Cobra or like a rattlesnake, really. Rattlesnakes are the ones with the fangs that come out and get you. Uh, and number two, he's from Ohio. You know, he has a big Ohio background. And number three, it looks like he can coach basketball, you know, yeah. especially the last five minutes of a basketball game, which is where Ohio State fell short the last several years uh, under Chris Holtman. That's, Chris Holtman's one of the nicest guys I've ever met, but, you know, that's just laying it out there. So uh, I think uh, he's made a real – a real strong case, but you're right. He's got to put the uh, exclamation point on it, and we'll see if he does or not. One last thing before we move on to my conversation with John Bacon about the future of major college football, uh, in the in basically looking forward five years and ten years from now. John Bacon's one of my favorite guys. Yeah, he's known for doing for for covering Michigan for a long time and being an expert on Michigan football, but he keeps his eyes open and his mouth shut, unlike me. Uh, I kind of like going to things blind with my mouth yapping. So we'll get to that conversation in just a moment. But one more thing. What is the kryptonite for Ohio State going into this Big Ten tournament? If there was kryptonite for this group, the thing I like is Diebler's almost prepared for a tournament because he's playing a lot of guys. A lot of guys have gotten a lot of time. And you're not – if one guy heads to the bench, you're not going, oh, no, you're having a guy come off the bench now who's at least performed in some form or fashion – the last several weeks in this big turnaround. But what is Ohio State's kryptonite going into this Big Ten tournament? Yeah, I mean, there would be two things that I would say, but both of them, they kind of just, you know, got through against Rutgers. And one of them would be when their shots aren't falling and they hit an offensive lull, their defense can sometimes suffer. But that wasn't the case against Rutgers. You know, they had offensive droughts, and that's going to happen against Rutgers, which is one of the best defensive teams in the country. But their defense was still committed. And the other thing is three-point shooting, which has just not been good all year for Ohio State at a consistent clip, but they were nine of 20 and they've hit timely threes during the stretch that Jake Diebler has been the interim head coach. They're only shooting 34 and a half percent from three, which isn't anything spectacular, but it is better than it was in the previous 12 or so games with Chris Holtman at the helm. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. I think just the spacing on the floor is better playing Dale Bonner with Bruce Thornton makes things a little bit easier and I think that they're just, you know, hitting shots. Sometimes it's as simple as that. Let me so interrupt would... you there. Could it be as simple too as you don't want a guy ball hog and you don't want a guy just jacking it up, but do they, do you sense the players feel a little more freedom to take that shot without repercussions? Is that, that yeah. loosens you up a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. And when you're running in transition as much as they are, you're going to have more open shots. I mean, you have three on twos, you have two on ones where there are shots that are open and and where we saw Roddy Gale Jr. sometimes hesitating to take those shots during a slump in January, he's not hesitating anymore. And he made two threes the other day against Rutgers. And, you know, you're seeing guys like Scotty Middleton start to make threes in a timely fashion and players that were struggling, you know, in January and February are now starting to step up and make shots. I would say those things, you know, rebounding is probably 
to me, the biggest kryptonite. Uh, you know, I think this team's been better on the glass, especially since Jake Diebler's taken over. Defensive rebounding for them has been an issue the last couple of years. So other teams getting offensive rebounds and second chance opportunities, I would say is, is the biggest kryptonite for Ohio State. If you see them starting to lose the battle on the glass and, you know, one opportunity turns into two or three for the other team, especially towards the end of halves, that's where games can get away from Ohio State. I got you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why I have Andy Backstrom on the Tim May Show. And whenever I'm on radio, I try to get him on as a guest spot because Andy Backstrom's a, a rising voice who keeps his mouth shut for the most time, but he's a rising voice in covering Ohio State, both football and basketball. Hey, Andy, uh, thanks for joining me again, man. I'm, uh, I'm going to segue here into my conversation with John Bacon, who uh, – He's covered Michigan sports for a long time. I mean, he kept a, let's more, more let's more uh, more to the point. He has commented and analyzed Michigan sports and the Michigan University of Michigan sports scene for a long time. He's an alum up there, but he's he's quite this he's quite the objective alum. Let's put it that way. And uh, and truth in advertising, we recorded this conversation about the future of of major college football five years from now, ten years from now. Us, me and him putting our two brains together and coming up with about three quarters of a brain. Yeah, I'm, I'm calling it out there. His being one half, mine one quarter. But uh, before even this, the latest development up at Michigan, Mike Hart, the longtime running bar, a long time, several years running backs coach at Michigan, not being retained or not being re-upped by Sharon Moore and this new staff. It's almost like they're circling the wagons up there and Mike Hart wasn't part of the circling. So, uh it's interesting where that program is going. It looks like they've given up on basketball at the University of Michigan, and that's what I started out with, uh, with my conversation right now with John Bacon. Oh, man, I smell bacon. I smell bacon in this room. Ladies and gentlemen, John Bacon, one of my favorite people of all time. Uh, just just ask him. Uh, John Bacon, uh, welcome back to the Tim May Show. And, uh, by the way, uh, you know, since you're an aficionado of all things Michigan sports, when did Michigan give up basketball? I don't remember the announcement. It was about two months ago, it was done very quietly. Um, it was right after the Ohio State game. That was their last time they competed. Uh, <laughs> did they? They did compete in the first half. You're exactly right about that. <laughs> well, not this, well today maybe, but uh, uh, but no. The when they beat the Buckeyes in a shocker a couple months ago, that was the the last time they really had much going on. Yeah. It's, isn't it, it's, isn't it, it, by the way, right now it's bad on the court, and it's not that much better off the court as you've seen. Yeah. The uh, controversial reports coming out about a altercation, I guess I'll call it, between Juwan Howard, who's supposed to be on a zero tolerance anger management program, and John Sanderson, a highly regarded strength coach who produced more than a dozen NBA draft picks out of three-star players under John Beeline. Uh, a great guy and a great, and I like Juwan Howard too. I think a lot of folks will say he's a great guy too, but this is not working. Yeah, so yeah, that's pretty yeah. Clear. I, was, I was gonna say, sometimes the signs, they are a flashing, but uh but I digress. You know, the main reason I wanted to get you on today, because uh, uh, you're one of my favorite people of all time, because you, you, you're you not only an author. And by, by the way, as I told you before we started, maybe the Michigan basketball situation could be fixed if they let them lead the players. <laughs> well, look you know at what I'm saying? Shameless plug, people. You can buy yeah. the stores nationwide. Yeah. yeah. And that thing's still selling like uh, hotcakes, isn't it? Uh, we're in our second printing. We're selling pretty well. And uh, a lot of speeches out of it, too. And Teams are picking it up. It's fun when they, we get it, we see bulk orders for General Motors, yeah, for various college teams. Uh, that's that's fun to see. So yeah, it's funny how people run one thing into the ground and they figure, okay, let's latch onto this. This will get us out of the <laughs> out of the turmoil. We'll let the we'll let the uh, line workers lead at GM. Uh, that that might work actually. Hey, uh, by the way, real quick before we move on, uh, your Edmund Fitzgerald book is it out yet? No, uh, I am going to finish it in November of this year, 2024, working on it today. Uh, it comes out in November of 2025. So we got gotcha. a year and a half before that comes out with the 50th anniversary of the sinking, which was November 10th, 1975. And I'm getting yeah. amazing interviews with family and friends and people who were on the on the lake that night. Just yeah. incredible stuff, a lot of new stuff, guarantee it. I was gonna say, watch out for the icebergs, but that was actually rogue wave stuff or wave rogue stuff. Rogue wave. Yeah. Hey, nice, nice job there, Texan. You're well welcome, done. man. You are, you know that Halifax book is still one of my favorite books of all time, just because literally while I'm reading that, I'm there when that explosion happens. You know, that's my goal with this also. Yeah. So 
I hope it works. I mean, I, I can't wait to read it. But uh, main reason I was speaking of Edmund Fitzgerald and the Halifax explosions and the uh, Titanic, uh, major college football and maybe mm -hmm. major college basketball, but definitely major college football has been in the news lately as in the last five years. Number one, number two, the idea that uh, the Big Ten and the SEC have finally said to hell with it, we're going to start running things, Basically. whether we – whether we divorce ourselves from the NCAA or not, we're going to make the rules. We're going to try to have foment rules, uh, form rules that adhere to where we're going with our programs, our NFL light programs. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but uh, boy, the, are we at the beginning of the end of the great split of major college athletics, of major college football, the powers that be, splitting away from the NCAA or are we at the beginning or, or, or are we at the end of the beginning where somehow or another the NCAA and major college football will still remain attached, but maybe like a, in a foster care situation. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the best uh, example I've seen. Yeah. Custodial basically. Well, you know, even foster care, the, the, the kids can, you know, cut up. You gotta, you gotta be able to uh, punish them, but go ahead. The, uh, I think the NCAA is going to exist, going to continue to exist. Um, I think they're so toothless now that they basically made a deal with the devil that with the powers that be, the SEC and the Big Ten have made it very clear, we don't have to listen to you. And if you weren't clear on that one, Texas A&M and Tennessee made it very clear in the last few months saying, whatever, dude, get out of here. Yeah, and now the Texas A&M athletic director is going to be the athletic director at Ohio State, Ross Bjork. So there you go. There you go. And uh, watch what happens next. Yeah. They, they'll have no patience with the NCAA. Yeah. Uh, the, the bluff has been called. They're toothless. The NCAA, that is. And that being the case, now you have a choice. Uh, if the NCAA really held its ground, okay, then I'd see the Big Ten and the SEC probably splitting off. Certainly the SEC first. Uh, but because the NCAA is basically going to say, you know what, we won't do anything to you. And they basically came out and said all investigations into NIL violations are, are stopped which means we're not even going to try on this one. So there are no rules, um, but keep on giving us the money for the March Madness and so on in the football playoff. And we'll keep on pumping out these great ads saying how wonderful the NCAA is. Yeah. The um, injunction. Yeah. The injunction that was won by the schools, uh, you know, especially Tennessee, the uh, attorney general of Tennessee basically called the NCAA's bluff for one of another term, but uh, right. Uh, what they found out was the NCAA is. I, I would think they would already know already know this. Being smart people, the you know the NCAA, the you know where you know the NCAA is Ohio State, it is Alabama, it is Tennessee, but you have a an executive branch running it. What they found out was there's a huge difference between rules and laws. You know what I mean? <laughs> rules are hey, let's all get together, okay? If you run out of bounds, it does not stop the clock anymore. You know what I mean? Uh, a law is. If you run out of bounds and hit somebody, you could, you know, you could go to jail. You know what I mean? Big difference. <laughs> but uh, right. but uh, that's a bad analogy. But you know, but but you know what I'm talking about there. And uh, that's the realm we're in now because the NCAA just kicked the can so far down the road that states passed laws or had executive orders that legally allowed uh, student athletes to enjoy the fruits of name, image, and likeness deals. And of course that immediately morphed into pay for play, no matter, no matter whatever else you want to call it from the collective standpoint, it's right. pay for play. And it's not just football and basketball, but other sports too are enjoying some of that. Uh, you, that genie doesn't go back in the bottle without the use of one word. And that word is contract hmm. or contracts. Uh, the idea that the NCAA is even, fathoming the idea of paying athletes, which Charlie Baker has put forth in some forms or fashion, just tells you there is a major thaw going on, right? No question. I think you're right about the contracts because if these collectives or whomever, boosters, et cetera, are going to pay a young man a lot of money, we're already into a million or two for various positions and various people. To do a car commercial. Right. Uh, guess what? They want to know what they're getting for that money. Now, in the old days, when Bo Schimbecker was making $21,000 for his first contract at Michigan, and Woody Hayes was not making any more for no. 10 years. No one else won a Big Ten title but those two, and they're the two worst-paid coaches in the league. Yeah. In that stretch. I believe Woody had the same deal that Bo had, which was a handshake deal. Bo had a handshake deal with uh, 
with Don Cannon, and I think with Weaver. Uh, one been, year appointments is what they called them at Ohio State. One year appointments, handshakes, etc. Man, that ain't working now. And yeah. that ain't going to work anymore with NIL either, I don't think. So once you're in a contract, you're an employee, and things are different. So what's going to happen, ironically, I think, is they're going to start getting a lot more money than they were before, of course, which is none legally. Um, but they're going to have a lot less freedom because now you're a paid employee yeah. and you take the coach. So what? You're yeah. in for two or three years because you're getting a million bucks. But let me ask you this, though. That's definitely better than the good old days, okay, for the players. Right? Oh, no uh, question. I, I, I've continued to believe in, you know, that the collectives uh, thing will run its course. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people uh, will be starting to shake, scratch their heads and shake their heads like, wait a minute, why am I giving you 1000 or I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the big time, the big time Charlie's, you know, the good time right. Charlie's that uh, jumped right into this pool but a lot of the fans, et cetera, will be start going, wait a minute, I've got, you want me to give money to this collective? Then you also want me to pay for a seat license or whatever. And you also want me to pay for parking exorbitantly. And you also want me to pay for $6 hot dogs and uh, $5 water bottles and things like that. I mean, you know, the turnip is going to run out of, out of juice, right? I, a friend of mine who's a big booster at Purdue is, has not renewed not renewed his tickets because it costs 1500 bucks. And he said, and when you see rich people who can afford it, no problem. Yeah. Say this is ridiculous and I'm done getting exploited. Um, that's when the gig is up. And I think yeah. that, I mean, my old line about that one is when you keep on treating your fans like customers after a while, they start behaving like customers and start saying, okay, I can spend this amount of money on tickets or new set of snow tires. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do not want you thinking rationally if I'm an AD. I want yeah. you to think about passion and so on about the alma mater. And that's going out the window. They've squeezed the golden goose too hard. And the gig is slowly but surely going up. And man, you watch. There's going to be a tipping point. And it's, it's kind of eroding a little bit here and there now. Once it starts really going downhill, watch out. Yeah. It's going to like yeah. crash hard. I, I think, think a lot of people are going, how much money do you need? You know what I mean? I mean, how much money do you need? Well, you need a lot. answer to that question, Tim. Yeah. I'm an avid Simpsons watcher. I admit from the old days, especially when Monty Burns. Yeah. When yeah. Homer Simpson says to Monty Burns, Mr. Burns, you're the richest man I know. And Monty Burns says, yes, but you know, I would trade it all for just a little more. So, <laughs> <laughs> and the but answer, you had a great line when we were talking. Your answer. That's it's a never, great line. But you had a great, you had a great line when we were talking earlier. I mean, you know, when you walk through the, the tailgates and all these things now at major college football games, you know, at Penn State and Ohio State and Michigan, they're all, you know, the stadiums are replete with these private suites and everything. And um, those people, a lot of them you think could hardly couldn't care less in right. some respects, not all of them, but some of them. They're there with their, you you use the term clients. It's almost like there are clients uh, at these tailgate parties more than there are just true, you know, dyed in the wool bleed scarlet and gray, bleed uh, bleed maize and blue uh, fans and stuff. I'm not sure that's accurate on a total sense because 105,000 people is still 105,000 people. You know what I mean? Who want to be right. there and do that? But but that is where it's that is where it's headed, and they cater they cater to that group, right? But they still want the rah rah fan there somehow, some way. Because that is the atmosphere of college football. That is what makes that is what sets it apart. It's the bands and the fans. Go ahead now. It's the bands and the fans. I like that one. Well, look, I mean, Cincinnati Reds baseball game, Red Wings hockey game. The first three rows of seats are ooh, they're, they're the corporate swells. Yeah. With the big seat licenses. And guess what? After the fifth inning, they're gone. Uh, in the third period, the best seats in the house for a Red Wings game are empty. And that's been true for years. So, okay, if you want that kind of money, you're going to get those kind of fans, non-fans, basically. Um, and the crazy ones are in the rafters. The ones you really want on the glass going nuts. Yeah. Uh, they're too far away. And that's going to happen increasingly uh, with the big house and with the, with the uh, Beaver Stadium, the Horseshoe, all these great mausoleums of football. Uh, you're pricing the, the hardcore fan out. And what we talked about earlier is I, I'm not seeing too many kids. I'm seeing clients. Who wants to take your kid? who might be half interested, eight or nine, doesn't really know the rules yet, whatever, to a four-hour football game for 500 bucks to, to either too hot in September, too cold in November, 
and you get rained out in October. Um, look, I mean, I got an eight year old kid. How appealing is that? 500 bucks. I got to yeah. think twice. Yeah. Yeah. I think what's going to be interesting. Uh, I'm going to be very interested in watching uh, if they ever figure out the format for the college football playoff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those first four games that are going to be played on college campuses, uh, how quickly they're going to sell the tickets. Okay. Uh, you know, the first four games right. are, the, are going to be played at the higher seeds uh, campus, how quickly they'll sell the tickets, but how long the fervor will last about the first round of games of selling tickets when in fact you think your team might be able to go the distance mm -hmm. we're talking about premium premium cost price tickets possibly four games in a row right. you know what i mean uh right. now granted only two teams make the make the championship i understand that so that would but that would be three games in a row at bowl settings for right. the for the teams in the eight the round of eight, uh, so I I don't know, man. I just people can't. That's a great only, only rich can afford that kind of stuff. And is that who you? Well, I guess it is who you want because that's who you're catering to right now. Yeah, but you have one hundred and ten thousand rich people uh, filling, you know, the horseshoe, filling Beaver Stadium, filling the big house. I keep on going back to these three. I would wait until Friday and see if they start giving out tickets. That's what I would do if I was a fan. <laughs> yeah. I mean, see if it's going to snow. <laughs> Look, I already saw some of this, Tim, with the four team format with Michigan. Yeah. But look, Michigan is a star for a national title as anybody 25 some years, um, since 97, of course, first time they ever got to the finals. Um, and look, getting to LA for the Rose Bowl against Alabama for the semis costs a ton of money because LA doesn't need you in January 1st. Right. Um, so that that's a two, three thousand dollar trip. And then Houston, far less popular eight days later, uh, that's another thousand, two thousand bucks. Um, I mean, I knew people who was, were going to do one or the other, but not both. Yeah. That's already happening in a, in a once in a lifetime season for Michigan, perhaps. Um, what's going to happen when you're in it, when you're in the, the, the 12 team, 14 team, whatever, when you're in that most years, who's going to pay for the first game if it's not at home? Yeah. Especially. So yeah. I, I think they've overestimated the interest in this. I think each time you add one more layer, you dilute it. And already this year, look, one of my favorite things in the world, and I'm sure yours too, is the Michigan Ohio State rivalry. It's, it's, it's the, that it survived 20 years of Michigan winning three games. It's pretty incredible. It shows you how what a good rivalry it is. Yeah, uh, to be that imbalanced for that long and still have some fire in it. But what's going to happen? This is the last year that, and Michigan fans are lucky that they won this year. It's the last year. It's going to be for all the marbles. The loser does not get in the playoffs. The loser cannot win a national title. The loser does not go to the Big Ten title game. All right. It's next year. You lost the game. Okay, it kind of sucks, but but good news. Right. See you next weekend. Yeah, uh, and and may play again in two weeks. Um, I remember we we talked about that before the Michigan game this year. People think I'm talking fun. I'm not. I mean, that could definitely happen. I mean, the scenario is there that would set up that happening of both teams still making the college football playoff, and maybe perhaps if not meeting in the first round, meeting in the second round. You know, oh, yeah. so you could literally Ohio State could beat Michigan in the game, Michigan could beat Ohio State in the champion Big Ten championship game, and then they would both have kind of a canceled each other out and hurt their overall college football playoff ranking in doing so, and suddenly might be five versus 12 or six versus 11 or, you know, or seven versus uh whatever they I got to get them all mixed up. But you know wow. what I'm talking about. Right. Absolutely. And to think that's not going to – to think that can't happen is ridiculous. Oh, of course. And again, it dilutes the whole thing. And again, it turns college football into NFL light. Yes. Uh, all this stuff. And look, I mean, if Michigan and Penn State and Ohio State get into the top 12 or whatever's going to be, 16, who knows, sooner or later, uh, almost every year, why the hell am I watching Michigan play Eastern Carolina in September? Yeah. You know, why not save my money for when the games actually matter, which is not yeah. now, not in yeah. September. Well, September is almost a lot. It's virtually a lost month in most schedules. Yeah, but if you remember correctly, when the Romans did it in the Coliseum, I mean, everybody knew the Lions were going to win went out over the Christians, you know. Uh, that is true. Most uh, of the time. I bet you still watched. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. But they were they were there for for the for the spectacle. You know what I mean? Right. So that's a Michigan uh, East Carolina is for the spectacle. Now don't bring App State into it. That could be a different kind of spectacle. <laughs> you can make a it's spectacle of here, yourself. Too soon. Too yeah. Soon. But yeah, it is too soon, isn't it? Yeah, that's been a long, long time ago. Uh, 18 years, man. Yeah, you remember like it happened five minutes ago, I'm sure. Uh, no, but, sorry, but, 17 years. But, the, but see, I want to get your take on this. What I'm, uh, Look, if somebody's offering you a lot of money to do something, it's difficult to stand on tradition, to stand pat. Right. You know, when in fact, coaches' salaries are not going back. Uh, right. Facilities, right. people that work at your facilities, Nothing's free anymore. It is amazing, though, as much as college athletics draws or brings in financially, they figured out a way to spend most of it. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, compared to when I first started covering this stuff way back in the 80s, actually back in the 70s. Uh, but how much – what bothers me about this is you just get the idea that the, bo the boys and the – the boys and the girls at the uh, major networks are what's really driving the boat here. That's what's really swaying. I mean, of course they are because they're guaranteeing them riches. Just do this and you're guaranteed to, guaranteed to be rich. And uh, how do you, but how do you stuff that genie back in the bottle? Cause we all love sitting down in front of the, I do in front of my 75 inch TV and my man cave and watching college football. When I'm not, when, when Ohio State's got the weekend off, I sit there and watch football. You know what I mean? No, I still love it. And, you got the remote right there. You got the big screen TV. Yeah. It's fun. I, I, I miss picture in picture because sometimes you need two or three games going at once. But yeah. Anyway, oh, yeah. I get that going. Someone will figure that out at some point. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, there's no question about that. The um, What's going to happen next as far as all this stuff goes? Yeah, I mean, but the, 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 you've already made this deal. I'm not going to call the networks the devil, but they are the provocateur. You know what I mean? Of, well, the, of this whole there's the one driving it no matter who says right. otherwise right um and i mean right now there are some what 44 bowl games espn owns more than 30 of them yeah uh, so they'll inventory it's called inventory for december hey man great don canham line the legendary michigan athletic director from way back um he, he was telling me that you know abc was dying for a night game in the big house they were pushing me all the time and so they wanted a night game badly and they're going to bring the license themselves and pay us a lot of money and all that stuff they wanted this thing so badly, and we didn't want one, so we compromised and didn't have one. Yeah, That's, yeah, exactly. Can them could go do this to NCAA. Find me that AD. No yeah. one's doing that anymore. Yeah, um, you know, take the money and and the fans. We always get mad at you know Fox and ESPN for these long TV timeouts and so on. Oh yeah, don't get mad at Fox and don't get mad at ESPN. Your ADs took the money. Once you take the money, they tell you when to kick the ball off. Yes. <laughs> when to come back from the break. You don't want the money. You can do whatever you want. Games yeah. last two and a half hours like the old days, and uh, you'll be out of there by 3 o'clock. My, my favorite thing is the countdown clock, you know, they, most stadiums have now that shows you how much time's left in the TV timeout, you know. Yet, yet, uh, yet guys running out of bounds or, uh, you know, whatever, that had to all be abolished so you could speed up the games. You know what I mean? Meanwhile, you turn around, and now they're talking about two-minute warnings at the end of the first half and the second half, which will be three-minute. Three-minute three minute timeouts for two-minute warnings. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, uh, and so that's got to be adding six minutes uh, to, to each game, no matter what. So they'll figure out another way to, uh, well, do we, you know, we're – as uh, after the kickoff, do we really need the ball? Do we need the clock to stop? You know what I mean? There will be all kinds of like concessions made so that even though they still show these games as being played in a three hour window in the schedules, none of them ever do, which is really bo you know, bogus. Three and a half hour uh, boxes. I I'm not taking it out on TV because I love watching football on TV. I love it. I hate when I'm covering football or being at a, a game, the, the three minute. TV timeouts and like Fox does now uh, occasionally the NFL style where if another team had an extended drive and probably Michigan had a lot of these is the last two years, they kick off and then there's another timeout. You know what I mean? Just like in the NFL. So yeah, three minutes of ads kick off, which is the most boring play now in college oh, football. Yeah. Nothing happens. Yeah. Um, he kicked it into the stands. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but, but here's my point. Three more minutes. You're right. It's, it's crazy. And what I, but I can't stand. Okay, fine. Go ahead. TV, yeah. TV you, you take the money. They can do a lot of things. But why are they so stupid as to not be able to find a way to make the same amount of money 
Yeah. Without these god awful timeouts, look, soccer never stops. I guarantee you, the World Cup is making plenty of money. Um, the Masters does not stop. They make plenty of money. Car racing, Formula One, NASCAR. They have side by side the car racing side by side. Uh, you know, there are ways to do this. They're very easy ways. And also, the simplest thing is, you know what? Here's a woman to stop. We'll charge three times more for because it's worth more. Because I'm not going to the bathroom. Yeah. For one minute, I'm not getting another beer. Or whatever. I'll watch. Yeah. And they're too dumb to figure that one out. They're killing it. Yeah. And, yeah. And what's their solution? Cut out football. Keep the same number of bats. That's the yeah. solution. Uh, out of bounds is no longer out of bounds. It's no longer yeah. Out of yeah. Just the. Uh, just make it like rollerball. Everything just keeps rolling, man. I mean, uh, uh, it's so well, simple to solve, and they can't solve it. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think they want to. To be honest with you, they want you. I mean, you know, it's like pack oh, a lunch, right. man. It's going to take all day. Although we will confiscate your lunch at the gate <laughs> 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 and your beer, but That's buy right. our it's beer. A five dollar yeah. bottle of water, right? Why do you want to bring in a six pack when you can get six beers for a hundred bucks? Um, <laughs> That's crazy. That. Yeah. Of course, hey. I'm of the era, young man, and you probably are too in Texas. Man, when I was a Michigan undergrad, we had no man. We would wheel in kegs. Oh, well, everybody <laughs> had something down their leg, you know, a flask or something. And uh, oh, yeah. back in the good old days, I mean, you know, that, the bottom line is once everybody, it's that it's that old saying: if if everybody's doing it anyway, why don't we make some money on it? That's exactly what they finally figured out, right? Right. And uh, it took them forever because they were standing on tradition. They were standing on, you know, more morality and all this kind of stuff. And in fact, that doesn't matter anymore. Let me ask you this, though. As Pete Thamel said on my podcast way back at the beginning of the season, um, you know, the guy that broke the Connor Stallion story. You remember him? Pete Thamel? Yeah. Um, but anyway, but I digress. Um, uh, the game has never been more chaotic off the field. It's never been better on the field. And I kind of – I definitely agree with that. I mean, you look yeah, at Ohio State – you look at Ohio State going into this year. Ohio State's out, offense coordinator now is Chip Kelly. You know what I mean? And but Chip Kelly, as much as he is a, I think he's brilliant, a brilliant offensive mind. Number number two, he's the one. He was uh, Ryan Day's offense coordinator at New Hampshire when Ryan Day was a right. quarterback. Right on down, they've worked together obviously in the NFL two years uh, with Philadelphia and in San Francisco. My, you know, so that's a match almost made in heaven. It appears. But what I'm getting to here is. Chip Kelly left as a head coach at an at a future Big Ten school, UCLA. Uh, he was trying to get a job in the NFL this past year, uh, or this past December offseason. That didn't work out. And then suddenly Bill O'Brien, uh, who was took the offense coordinator job at Ohio State, all of a sudden goes to goes to Boston College to take the head coaching job, his dream job. Meanwhile, the guy who had been the head coach at Boston College left to become uh, defense coordinator with what the Green Bay Packers, Jeff Halfley, because basically on his way out the door said, you know, can't take this, can't take this portal NIL stuff anymore because when you're on the other side of the curve in the NIL realm, which is what Boston College is, which is what UCLA is, for some reason UCLA is, you can't come, yeah, you can put a team out on the field, but like we said in the transfer portal NIL era, you can't get those superstars. You're not in the running for those guys that are transferring, et cetera, and or you're signing out of high school. How do you fix how do you fix that? Do you fix it with contracts like we said a while ago? Or do you just let everything play out? Boy, good question there. It's funny how the open transfer I mean, when, when head coaches are leaving FBS schools to, oh, yeah. to become a, an assistant somewhere else. That's crazy. And and FBS football is insane right now. Uh, Chip Kelly leaving the head coaching job for an OC job. Uh, I know a bunch, and you do too, uh, very good coaches who want nothing to do with the college game right now, yeah. who, who whose personalities fit better in the college game. They love their own experience in the college game. They used to coach the college game. This is nuts. It's beyond recruiting. It's handling things that I'm not equipped to handle. Yeah, I think I get it. Uh, I mean, that was part of Harbaugh's thinking, I'm sure. Yeah, well, wait, 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 wait. I mean, one of it is you're recruiting, and then you're coddling, or as I call it, re recruiting. So guys won't leave and go somewhere else. That's right. Uh, and then you're also looking in the transfer portal because you were very much now. I mean, if you're not embracing the transfer portal now, you're losing. Shame on you. You're losing. You're behind because the world has moved on without you. You understand? Right. So I mean, Tom, Tom Izzo in basketball, you yeah. know, is a fantastic coach at Michigan State. I admire him very much. Uh, consider him a friend, uh, if one can do that in journalism. 
but he's not embraced the transfer portal and it's starting to hurt Michigan State. Now I yep. get why he's not, and I partly admire him for being stubbornly old school in some ways. Debo uh, Sweeney. Yeah. But Matt I mean Thompson. Yeah. This is how the game is played. And I get why coaches have had enough of it. It's it's a crazy process. Here's the weird thing. There's more structure and transparency in NBA and NFL contracts and personnel than there is in college, which who saw that coming? Yeah, Um, exactly. You you know where you stand in the NFL and you got a guy in a five-year contract. He ain't going anywhere unless you say he is. Um, Who can say that in college anymore? And also who's paying the guy? It's not the school. It's some booster who, what if he gets sick of it? What if he wants to say, Hey, my guy's not starting. I mean, who knows how this stuff works? So there was, this, sure you're right, there, coming. there was this great Larry David episode, our Curb Your Enthusiasm episode, about two or three, four seasons into it, where Larry David has, has become a joint owner or maybe a primary owner of a restaurant and ends up, his one chef quits. So he ends up hiring this chef who's got, who's a great chef, but he has Tourette's. And so near the end of the, uh, near the end of that night, people are, you know, are having a pretty good time. And all of a sudden the chef starts cursing uncontrollably in the back room okay and larry gets this worried look on his face like oh no this is going to run people off and then all of a sudden you know his uh his agent's wife comes walking in and says you effing larry david blah 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 and then this couple over here starts effing and effing and this couple starts effing and effing and all of a sudden everybody's having a good time saying the f word right and larry david has this great look on his face like success like this like you know and then he kind of goes like this he kind of goes this worried look on his face it goes dissolves to a worried look on his face like wait a minute we got to do this again tomorrow night <laughs> I mean, you know what i mean <laughs> to keep up the deal and that's kind of what kind of what the transfer portal in, in the nil have done to college football is you you got to do this every day but definitely every year right and well not only that can you coach the way you want to coach right you coach used to coach Right. I mean, no. Coach, as I knock my computer around. That's all right. There, coach my high school hockey team. If I had NIL on the portal, I mean, I was demanding in a lot of ways, and I'll tell you that. Um, I could be, I guess. I was not going to cut anybody on my team. Yeah. Who'd been on the team and all that. So I wasn't playing games like that. Uh, but, but when uh, your job's on the line, man, uh, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to work. I really don't. And I think a lot of coaches don't either, and they've probably had enough. So yeah, well, that's why when the earlier segment when we were talking when we were talking earlier, the word is contracts because when you get contracts in a state school, for example, if Ohio State signs uh, Joe Kokomo to a big time uh, you know big time quarterback to a contract, and you have a salary cap, you know I can FIA or FOIA that that information, and uh, so. Everybody can keep tabs on everybody except, I guess, Notre Dame and Vanderbilt and Northwestern. <laughs> but if they're part of a league, they will have to be at least answering to the league that we're not over our salary cap and this is how we've uh, meted it out and this is how we're going to play football. That's the only way you really – you could people can come up with all these kind of ideas, but that's the only way is to regain control of the people who are playing for you but remunerate them heavily. I agree with that, and that's almost certainly what's going to happen. But here's an odd question to consider, and that is that in the NFL, of course, you got a salary cap, and I think they follow it quite well uh, as a rule. Um, so, all right, fine. Man, college has got such a long history of cheating. Of course. There's a salary cap for the SEC schools. You want to bet on that? Well, here's, no, here's the thing, though. In the NIL realm, because you're not going to put – NIL is here to stay. Uh so you could have your players, your primary players under different contracts, but the NIL is still going to be a pot, just like players can do commercials in the NFL if they want to, you know what I mean? Right. Uh, but have to be approved by their team or their by the NFL. That The NIL will still be there. The NIL is not going away. Uh, right. It's just the idea of signing players to, to, na- to uh, national letters of intent and then – them understanding that if they come there, they're also going to get this out of the NIL. That's what has to be somehow or another uh, corralled. And number two, having the player have an obligation to the school. Because, you know, the players who make this argument that, well, my coach can get fired tomorrow. I should have the right to go. You know, NFL coaches get fired all the time. You don't, they don't lose their play, rights to their players. That's I mean, right. that's not the way it works. In all pro sports, that's not the way it works. Well, 
in the in major college football and basketball are pro sports now. They are officially. And the IRS, by the way, is going to be onto that one. Yeah. I'm, on. I'm still waiting for that scandal to happen. That, that's, that's, that shoe's going to drop. That's yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, I'm kind There's of one thing about cool. telling the, telling the NCAA to go pound sand. There's a whole lot different thing about telling the IRS to go pound sand. Yeah, they don't because you'll be pounding rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, though. I'm sorry. You will find them less amused by the yeah. yeah by the comment. No question about that. Look, I mean, I can't recall. This is our off the record pre conversation already been taped on this one, but uh, no players going to find they can have more money and less freedom. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. And like I said, Fox TV going to pay you money. Guess what? They're telling you when you're kicking off. They're telling you. Uh, you know, it was 12 o'clock, 3.30 or 7 o'clock. They're telling you how long the TV timeout is because yeah. you took the money. Yes. So the athletes who take the money are going to find that their options are going to be limited. I'm not saying this is an argument for going back to the way it was. I cannot defend that. It was an absurd system, to say the least. But I, my model, as you know, goes way back to fourth and long from 2012, one of my books. Uh, what you need in football and basketball is what you've had for a century in baseball and hockey, and that is a viable minor league. You don't want to be a student. You want to take the money, go right ahead, but keep the colleges out of it. So you never had the same kind of problems in baseball and hockey you've had in football and basketball. You still, under this crazy system even, have one path to the NBA and one path to the NFL. And once that's the case, it'll still be screwed up in some dramatic fashion. One that we've not talked about yet is academics. Yeah, I have taught exactly. At yeah. I've taught at Michigan. I've taught at Miami of Ohio. When I flunk a player and I flunk him in all three places, no one tells me otherwise. All right. Is that going to work with NIL? If some millionaire, billionaire uh, car dealer has got a $2 million in that quarterback and I flunk him. Flunk him. I'm not going to hear from that guy. <laughs> He's going to steamroll me. Well, hey, you may not hear from that guy, but you may hear from some of his guys. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, <I've worked. laughs> the, the, the thumb breakers, right? Yeah. 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 No, you're right. John, see, that's the thing that's totally left out of all these conversations. You know, it used to be in the offseason, what you were concerned about, you know, covering Ohio State was, uh, is somebody going to be academically – I mean, in Ohio State's – I'm saying this, you, you you probably feel the same way about Michigan. Ohio State is, is recruiting uh, – it's not knocking other guys back, but Ohio State's recruiting a real high level – I've interviewed them. I, I'll young man, them. young men now. I mean, it's – sure. I mean, a lot – I mean, you, and you can see – uh, just like you dealt with at Michigan over the over the last several years too, and you see these guys give a damn. I mean, most of the major players that matter on this football team came back because they want, just like Michigan players did, they want a, another shot at a championship and beating Michigan and going to the college football playoff and winning a national championship. Once that's gone, it's gone. You know that opportunity is gone. And I wonder about that the the gravitational pull of an yeah. Ohio State, of a Penn State, of a Michigan. It's still strong enough that, you know, this year's Michigan team, a lot of the seniors came back. Now they got some NAL money, no doubt about that. Oh, yeah. But, well, no. Yeah. I think that's where NAL has helped right. the situation. The, you know the what I mean? Moses Day Fund, they call it, of course. Yeah. Him. That makes sense to me, by the way. I'd rather yeah. pay, see your school pay a, a senior come back who's good, and you know he's good and a good guy. Yeah. Um, I'd rather see that than, you know, paying money to some unknown freshman. You don't know what you're getting. Yeah. Um, yeah, and may, yes, may, the, may transfer in a year. Yeah. But where's that going to be in five or 10 years? Yeah. So even the Michigans and the Ohio States, who are as loyal a, a, a team base, if you will, as you can find, where they still have the kind of pull that a guy is at least partially irrational and coming back for a senior year versus the NFL uh, combine and all that. I don't know. I yeah. really don't know. Yeah. Well, we, you know, I mean, I don't think for the superstar guy like Marvin Harrison Jr., he had no – he had a decision to make just based on how he wanted to leave college. Is this yeah. the way I want to leave my college career? That was his only decision because financially uh, collectives and stuff, you know, NILs aren't going to help. I mean, they're, they're not going to compete with that realm of player, you know, from a financial standpoint, but, uh, but, did, but it, what got me though, is it does matter. What is what came through to me loud and clear is it does matter to these guys, what they're leaving behind the, the shot, you know, that they know they'll never have again, you know, and heck, I don't know how many ex Ohio state, ex Ohio state players live in the Columbus, greater Columbus area oh, area and stuff, because this is, this they is more back, than a whole man. First of all, a lot of them are from Columbus. 
Well, I have to say it's biggest advantage over Michigan. It's pretty obvious. Yeah, but but all a lot of them are not from Columbus. A lot of them from around around the country. See, that's the problem you have True. in this era now is you're recruiting whole hog the entire. It, you know, it's hard to believe a guy from California is going to really give that big a damn about the Ohio State Michigan game until he plays in it. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, because he didn't grow up in the midst of it. He heard about it, but uh, you know, it's not like every player from playing for Ohio State is within thirty mile c- circumference of a. Uh, you know, of the uh, of Ohio sure. Stadium or diameter, well, man, whatever, you know what I mean. Michigan Ohio State game is always radius. A following. What? what I find with Michigan players yeah. is they all come to Ann Arbor knowing full well that Buckeyes are your rival. Yeah. That's the game. If you're from out of the state, what they don't realize is that Michigan State, you better watch out. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the one they end up asleep on until they get knocked around a little bit in that game. Then they realize, okay, this one counts too. Yeah. Um, so the Michigan Ohio State game, I think, will hold that kind of prestige. For a while, but it does impress me that the Ohio State players come back. A lot of Michigan players do too. But what I was going to get to earlier, the big advantage that Ohio State has over Michigan is Ohio State uh, high school football. Yeah. It's not the university, but Michigan high school football cannot hold a candle to Ohio State, the state of Ohio. Yeah. Uh, football. And by the way, Michigan started recruiting those guys again. I find me a Big Ten title Michigan team that's not got at least five. Five and I say ten, uh, damn good kids from Ohio. Yeah, yeah, uh, gotta happen. That's yeah. that's. Jim crazy. Harbaugh was born in Toledo. I mean, you know, I'm well aware of this fact. Gary Moeller was a captain <laughs> at Ohio State. Bo Schimbeckler was from where? Uh, Barberton, baby. Barberton. I mean, Barberton. you know, right on down the line. You know, oh. uh, uh, Dennis Franklin, Desmond Howard, the Heisman Trophy winners, Woodson yeah. and Desmond Howard. Yeah, Mike uh, Borden was from uh, Bexley or you know uh, East. Right. You know. One yeah, of the rare his old guys clan. Played both teams, right? His old clan converted. And by the way, uh, uh real it quick is. before we before we go though, it's funny because I had John Arbesnik on a couple of weeks ago on this podcast because he started this fund to go fund me for an Ohio former Ohio State player who's had some just a couple of medical emergent medical dire medical situations in a row and uh could use the financial help. And I'm and I saw this name John Arbesnik. I go, who in the who is John Arbesnik? You know, and then I looked it up. Yeah. Right. Former former Michigan player who's best great friends with Tom Cousineau. He and Tom Cousineau watched the uh, national championship game in John Arbesnik's, uh, 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 I guess, uh, man cave, right? bachelor pad or whatever. Not bachelor pad, but uh, his man cave in, in Hobie Sound, uh, uh, Florida. I mean, his point was, I grew up with Mike Gullick and Tom Cousineau, and I got to know Tom Levinick, you know, but uh, – they all grew up together, but they went to three different places, you know, Notre Dame, Ohio State, and Michigan. Right. Why wouldn't we be buddies after that, you know? And you he- know, and, and fans will never believe this, but you've been around them. And I've actually emceed a, an event with uh, Michigan Ohio State players, a private one at the Detroit Athletic Club. Archie Griffin, one of the finest men I've yes. met in any field, anywhere. And anybody's met the guy will tell you that. Yes. And I told Archie that – you know, I ruined my childhood because <laughs> the first four Michigan Ohio State games I saw were all Archie Griffin's games. Three losses and a tie for Michigan. The tie was the most bitter one of the oh yeah, oh yeah four events. And he's, it really was. It was, it was the biggest loss for Michigan of those four. <laughs> uh, was the tie absolutely yeah. not a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you meet these guys and the respect they have for each other. Yeah, and especially I find by the way the Woody guys and the Bow guys the special yeah. bond there because the only poor bastard. Who had it rougher than you did? It was the other guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, they they grew up in the same system, and they had more in common with each other than with Indiana, Illinois, UCLA, oh, yeah. anybody else. Yeah, you know, they were the elite. the The big two and the little eight was was definitely true. Now, I want, I want that's what I wanted to end. It's funny how you segued right in there for me uh, with this final thing I wanted to ask you about. Eighteen teams in the Big Ten, four from the former Pac-12, which is no more. Well. You know, I'm talking about for football season. Uh, I know they're still playing basketball, baseball, track, tennis, uh, golf. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, of course, the 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 SEC going to what uh, 16 teams next year, adding right. uh, 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 Oklahoma and Texas. It, was this inevitable? And the reason I'm asking this is is because I think another shoe will drop eventually. Where after the money runs out or after something goes wrong with these TV contracts, 15, 10, 15 years from now, 
and things regress. Maybe they won't. Maybe TV will keep getting these big rate the ratings they they seek. But I but we've all known conferences have come and gone throughout the history of of major college athletics. Mountain West, right on. You know what I mean. I can name you. I remember when Tulane was in the SEC when I was growing up, for example. Wow. So was Georgia Tech at one point. But they're you know, my point is, twenty years. I asked you about five years from now or earlier. Twenty years from now, what are the Big Ten and SEC going to look like? Are they going to be even larger? Are Notre Dame and somebody else, maybe North Carolina, going to be in the Big Ten? And are Clemson and and Florida State and maybe two other teams going to be in the SEC? What's your crystal ball say before we wrap this up? Man, that is a great question. And I haven't even had a hard time predicting that one. I suppose I can see two models. One is basically the NFL model or the college basketball model where fine, you can call it whatever you want, but that's going to be the West region. That's going to be the Midwest region. That's the Southeast region, which become de facto conferences essentially. Yeah. Um, so that's one possibility. Wait a minute. Do you think that's what they want? Do you think that eventually they want major college football, 40 teams, 20 in each, Big Ten, 20 in the pack? Because they will they will span the nation, you know, ocean to ocean, you know, top to bottom. Of those right. those conferences will. Uh, do you think that is what the, that is the that is the plan going on in somebody's head right now that you'll have 40 teams in two different conferences and they will have a playoff situation set up to where they will eventually play for that, whatever you want to call it, national championship? Do you think you that's what, the grand plan of somebody? The, what they want, that's the easiest question you ask them that. What they want is more money. Yeah, more <laughs> money. So whatever whatever creates the additional cash flow, that's what they're going to do, including imploding a once proud conference, goes back a century more, Pac-12. The fans didn't ask for that. The players didn't ask for that. The alumni didn't ask for that. The coaches didn't ask for that. No. All right, it was just the money. Yeah. Just the TV wanted that. So that's why the Pac-12, it's back to your earlier point. It's not the fans making these decisions. It's not anyone else, really. It's just the money. Yeah. And so far, and I recall that great scene um, years ago, um, Sonny Vaccaro, of course, yeah. uh, depicted well, of course, in uh, the Nike movie. Um, as Bryce Jordan of Bryce Jordan Arena fame at Penn State, the former president of Penn State, all these August presidents are here in some fantastic big room. 100, 200 of the biggest presidents in the country. And they say, why should we let you put your logo on our jerseys and our student athletes jerseys? And Sunday Vaccaro says, you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All we can do is offer the money. We can't make you take it, but not one of you here will turn the money down. There you and go. The UNC chancellor said you could hear a pin drop because their BS has been called out. They can't make you take the money. They can't make you implode the Pac-12. You can only do it if you're you know, if you're, you know, greedy enough for the money. So, yeah, yeah. So it could be regions. Although here's another possibility, and I wonder about this one. If I'm just crazy, because this, this one's a bit more out there. At some point, do the Northwesterns, the Dukes, the North, you know, the Notre Dame, Vanderbilt, the Vanderbilt. I I like to think Michigan's in that group, but you can debate that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's they, debate it. Don't go ahead. There you go. You can say, okay, this is not what we want. This is out of control. This is crazy. These are hotshot academic institutions. We're, we're not going to do this anymore. And I wonder if it then becomes bifurcated. The SEC is never going to stop this, I don't think. No. Auburn, Alabama, all that. Whatever's going to happen in that direction, they'll be leading it. Um, but at some point, you get a, an Ivy League light of schools that say, screw this. This is nuts. If you want to get paid, go to Alabama. If you don't, Northwestern's a great place to go to school. Yeah. Um, that might be the, the minor leagues we're talking about at some point. Yeah. So, but you know, but you know that little line about the NFL is the NFL, every NFL franchise, and I don't know if it's still the case, but I would think it would be because the money's only gone up. Every NFL franchise is guaranteed to make money before they ever open the door because of their TV revenue and they other do revenue. It, two and 16 these days, or whatever they're playing now. Yeah. And but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. everything else is Pete gravy. Pete got them together. Yeah. Yeah. Pete Rozelle got them together in the early 60s as a 33 year old lawyer. He said, look, if you ever just shut up and let me run this thing, yeah. we all in this thing together, we're all going to make more money. And, I mean, Green Bay, in a town smaller than Ann Arbor, Michigan, yeah. they're one of the biggest revenue producers for the NFL in both merchandise and ratings. Right. That's what matters. Right. Uh, that place has been sold out forever, of course. Fannies um, and seats. Fannies and yeah. seats, either in front of the TV or at the stadium. Exactly That's exactly right. it. So, 
<laughs> that formula works and why would it not go in that direction sooner or later in college? Yeah. Where everyone shuts up and we all get, you know, everyone work together and you all make money. That's But the only difference is going to be, despite what the COVID years have shown us where guys have gotten seven years of eligibility or <laughs> seven, a seventh year, you know, uh, it has happened. It, eventually you still got to have those restrictions of five, five years. Well, not, I think you ought to have five years to play five basically, you know, but, uh, but like you just said, down the line, five years from now, we're going to be asking, okay, what is academics and progress toward a degree? Are y'all still doing that? <laughs> right? Look, in some schools, we both know we've heard plenty of stories. And by the way, I'm never wearing black again with a black leather jacket thing. Yeah, my I, I, I got to know because it makes my shoulder yeah. I look like a football player when I do that with my black jacket. R rookie mistake there. <laughs> um but you know it's, it's what we're just talking about talking about the uh well we were we were just talking about our academics like we said a while oh. ago our academics uh progress story degree and, and and yeah. grade point average are they are they going to matter five years from now the schools that wanted to matter are we fighting an uphill fight because you and i've already heard stories of other schools we know them i'll spare them in this episode but i've been hearing those stories just hilarious stories if you're not involved um of of complete academic corruption unc got busted with that basically and they decided screw it that's who we are we're keeping the titles yeah Basketball titles that is of course yeah um, so i think the pressure on academics will be so much greater to not pay attention to it um the schools that do boy you're you're fighting a noble battle but i'm not sure how long that can work well i was gonna say i mean i remember when ohio state uh, in 1961 won the big 10 championship but was denied the chance to go to the go. rose bowl because right. football was getting too big for its britches and uh according to the faculty and uh and whatever I, I i don't see anybody standing up on any kind of mountain anywhere claiming that now football's never been more bigger for its britches than it is now in major college major college oh, football. yeah no one's the, the presidents have checked out of that of that debate yeah you yeah. know bryce jordan's anymore asking those questions it's almost like Instead of big, too big for their britches, they're wearing expando overalls, you know, with no shirt <laughs> and just keep whatever. No, ah, this is great. <laughs> you got to throw in the Texan line once in a while. Well done, yeah. sir. Well yeah, done. exactly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's uh, John Bacon. John Bacon, I uh, appreciate you joining uh, the Tim May Show again. I just want to ask one question and give me a sure. short answer. This has been the most incredible January and February that just finished in Ohio State football history, at least as long as I've been covering it, from a team that was downtrodden uh, at the end of December to turning itself around, almost remaking itself, players coming back because they want to be part of something big, players transferring in from Alabama, of all places, because they want to be something, part of something bigger. <laughs> no, big. Uh, coaches, the coaching carousel is what it is, but Ryan Day stepped up and revamped his staff and brought in, like I said, Chip Kelly as his office coordinator. Uh, uh, the recruiting is over the top. Ohio State got the number one player in the recruiting ranks for 2024, and Jeremiah Smith, the wide receiver from Florida, and got the number one player in the transfer portal, uh, Caleb Downs, a safety who had been in Alabama for one year. Uh, they got the number one quarterback in the 2024 recruiting class who had already signed up and was going to school at Alabama, but Nick Saban retired. And he said, I'm going to go to Ohio state, which was basically a second choice way back when they also got one of the top quarterbacks in the 2024 class already in Aaron Nolan. My point is you're paying attention to that way up there, yeah. right up there in greater Ann Arbor, uh, Ohio state, Michigan, are they, are they, Passing in the night as we speak. Well, we'll find out in late November, won't we? But yeah. um, that, that documentary last year on Rivals that you and I were both in, uh, they did a great job of that, and they broke it down kind of scientifically. The one best predictor of any team's success is the success of its rival. Because once your rival has success, guess what? Screw that. We are catching up and going past them. Yeah. Oh, I mean, look, once once Michigan got their act together under Bo, those are some of the best Buckeye teams of all time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because uh, they had to be. Yeah. Um, and they were. So, I mean, right now, clearly, Ohio State has heard the call with the staffing, the recruiting, the NIL work and so on, raising millions of dollars for this. And Michigan right now, they're they're trying to reload. 
uh, but it, almost everything's going to be at least partially new. Do you sense the offense? You, yeah. Do you sense a sense of satisfaction among the Michigan faction? I mean, do you sense a sense that they've won a national championship finally, first first time since 1997? People keep throwing this in there. Well, yeah, but that was you know whatever that was split. I go, it was two polls back then. I mean, we didn't have a playoff. You, Alabama took took credit for split national championships. Are you kidding me? But my point is, do you sense the fan base, not the people that get on Twitter occasionally just go nuts, right. but do you sense the fan base is sort of, okay, man, that was great, you know? Actually, I do. Or do they want to stay at the top of Mount Everest, which they is extremely top, tough? Of course, and they're pretty ticked off that Michigan didn't keep Harbaugh, which they, they probably could have if they played their hand better. Um, but Not uh, me. I think he was gone. I think he wanted to scratch that itch again, man. Well, there always has been that itch, and I can't. And yeah, I, he and he admitted to it. You know, the, the the honest answer is we'll never know. You can't run the experiment twice, right? Different circumstances and so on. So we'll never know, right? Uh, but we all we know this. He's in the NFL. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. Oppenheimer moment. Yeah. Exactly right. So, um, so fans are a bit ticked off about that, but the overall sentiment, you you guessed correctly on this one, um, is that a, a satisfaction? I wouldn't quite call it complacency. Now, when, but they know yeah, damn well that Michigan's not going to win a national title this year. You get yeah. fooled a bet on that, just based on the turnover and the offense, and JJ's gone and all that. Staff, everything, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, this is not Alabama, where if you win it, if you don't win it two years in a row, you're pissed off. Yeah, uh, yeah. They, they won the last in '97. Before that, in 1948. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so no, I think there's quite a bit of contentment around here, and a lucky feeling. I think most Michigan fans will tell you that it was the last year that Michigan Ohio State was all the marbles. The last year is a four-team playoff. Just getting there is a big deal. Um, and, I mean, they had the advantage of they played all Alabama the first game and Washington the second. There's nothing cheesy about that. Um, so that feels good, too. But, man, this year, if Michigan makes the playoffs this year, that's a good year. Yeah. Also, by the way, look at that schedule. Yeah. As much crap as Michigan got last year, fairly, for a weak non-conference schedule. And Big Ten wasn't that great last year outside of – the usual suspects uh next year's michigan schedule is insane brutal uh, oh you can bring next year you can bring last year's team back to play that schedule yeah maybe a loss or two yeah um, yeah you're playing texas all right at home uh for michigan oregon uh washington you're playing only the good pac-12 teams yeah um, and then of course uh, i think usc on top of that and then of course ohio state at ohio state and there's no way that ohio state's not smelling blood for that one. Now, yeah. if you had to ask me right now, who's going to win that game, I'd probably take Ohio State in four or five points. But I recall the Cooper years. <laughs> and if and if Ryan Day loses next year after all this, I would not want to be Ryan Day. Yeah. Uh, because the pressure on him, man, Michigan takes it seriously, but not nearly as seriously as Ohio State does. Yeah. Uh, they yeah. eat their own, man. They, they fire their coaches. One yeah. coach has not been fired since World War II, and it's Urban Meyer. Uh, all the rest get fired. Yeah. Later. Or, or brutal. Yeah. Uh, hastily urged to resign for the good of the program. Uh, right. right on down the line. No, you're exactly right, man. Uh, it's, this is a, you know, Ryan Day knows it too. I mean, you know, he's not, he's not hiding from anything. He understands. I he understands. Credit. He understands how things stack up. Uh, I see Oregon, Ohio state probably being going into the season. I, this is no big, big bulletin being the top two with Penn state getting a nod and then maybe Michigan right after that, you understand what I'm saying? Maybe a top, yeah, th top four. Ten, I mean, I don't know if out of respect, Washington's got a lot of long way to go to rebuild USC. Yeah. I'm not sure what USC is going to be about this year. Go ahead now. I can't tell with USC either. Yeah. Uh, with Lincoln Riley and all that. Um, we'll see. Yeah. Um, but I know this find me outside of what Clemson and Florida state. Does anybody outside the the new Big Ten and the new SEC have a chance? I, I got two schools, and I just named them. <laughs> yeah. There's no yeah. one outside those two. Okay, Notre Dame, of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's. And the bad like, news, the bad news for those teams is probably they're going to be the visitors, you know, <laughs> in that first round. You know? Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so whatever like, they do. That is one thing for all the craziness and all the things that have changed and all this. There's one thing I'm dying to see. Really? Yeah. Give me but see, here's US the thing. Where you go? This idea of Michigan hosting Miami of Florida 
on December the 20th, okay? Right. Uh, you and I both have seen teams in the NFL that aren't supposed to be used to cold weather, you know, they can suck it up for one day. You know, is that they'll, what's that old line that one team used one time? Well, yeah, you know, they came in and won the game and left. He goes, yeah, he goes, you know, we only got to do this for one day. You guys got to do it for six months, you know. <laughs> and and it's good. But, I mean, an Ohio State team that's built the way this Ohio State team is built, I don't want to see a big, huge snowstorm and guys sliding all over the place because it's not conducive to where, the way Ohio State likes good to play football. football. I agree with that, but you still want it to be a little cold in the air. Trust me. Well, yeah, yeah. You want it to be 25 degrees, 30 degrees, whatever else. Give me USC. Yeah. Give me Texas at the big house of the horseshoe in November. Michigan's played Miami and other schools, of course, in September. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Um, but no, I want it. That is the one thing because uh, look, the, the bowl records, of the big 10, everyone's been caterwauling about for decades. Right. Well, you're playing in their backyard. It's not right. I mean, play that game in in the horseshoe. Let's see. Who, let's see who wins that one. Yeah. Couldn't uh, they just move it to Ford Field? Or, uh, yeah. <laughs> or, or like like Gene Smith and, talked about going to uh, Lucas Oil Stadium, and you know all the, all these Iowa State fans. I was one of the ones saying, "Yeah, I mean that's what I want to see. I want to see, I want to see even even Stephen as in. I don't want the weather to dictate anything. You not know me, I mean? man. I'm not me. Give me the weather." Yeah. I know, but see, but the, the, the football Packers, the Packers do very well at home in the playoffs. I know football is a crazy sport because it starts when it's ninety five degrees out and ends when it's minus five. You know what I mean? Just ask the Miami Dolphins that played in the Kansas Midwestern City. Does. Remember? Although I got to say, man, I'll take Midwestern as we call it, Tim. Football weather. Yeah. Or Alabama can't play a day game in September. Yeah. Uh, Arizona well, can't play a day game in September. You can't do it. All I know is when the snowball happened in nineteen fifty. It looked like there were maybe 30,000 people there max, you know, yeah. in the stands. We but, don't need that. We don't need but that. But in history – Kessler was the coach. In that? history, every other person you met was there, you know what I mean, for the game. Right. <laughs> so, anyway. Anyway, yeah, ask Ohio State if he was to play, play that game again. I mean, what, 154 punts or something. But, anyway. One of the, I, the, one of the Buckeyes comments in the uh, HBO Rivalry uh, documentary, they did a great job with that. He said, uh, I was afraid I was going to be left for dead underneath yeah. the snow. Yeah, yeah, nobody would know it for three days. <laughs> hey, John Bacon, uh, I think that bacon's done, man. It's time for us to enjoy breakfast, but uh, I really appreciate you being on the Tim May Show again. Oh, my my pleasure. By the way, I would take a BLT, actually. Uh, not not a, but. Uh, my wife, Christy, makes a great one. Christy Bacon, I, how about that for a name? Dude, if your wife doesn't make the greatest BLT known to man, who would? You know, that's she all does. I got to say. She does. It's great. All right. John Bacon, uh, hey, thanks for shameless plug. Let them lead the book, but also yeah. let them lead the podcast. You know, we got some football guys in there too. A lot of fun about leadership. Uh, let them lead by bacon.com. There's the yeah, shameless plug. We're, uh, oh, let them lead by bacon.com. Yep. Is the, is the, uh, uh, yeah. Is it on any of the uh, podcasts? Oh, yeah. Oh. Okay. I'm, let them lead. I'll be sure Don't to go. tune in. That's the first time I've heard of it and uh, won't be the last. Yeah. Kind of like the Conan O'Brien podcast well for me. Yeah. We're doing well with it. Good numbers. John Bacon, thanks for joining the Tim May Show. Tim May, always a pleasure. Take care, buddy.